Okay. Um, now, Descartes has uh, another argument, and this argument is based on a concept. And this is why I think rationalism is a bad idea, bad name, or is, is now a bad name for Descartes' style of philosophy, because I think it should be called conceptualism. So you could put parenthesis. Next to rationalism, conceptualism. In, it, it, next to rationalism, when you when you name in your notes, to remind yourself that rationalism is not the doctrine that everybody should be rational. Empiricists and people, other people who are not rationalists, think that people should be rational too. It's rational. What characterizes rationalism again is the quest for certainty. and rejection of the senses. So, now, now I'm going to give one of Descartes' famous arguments, and, um, and it's actually one of my favorites. I, I don't think it's a good argument. In fact, I think it's a terrible argument. But in Descartes' defense, nobody at the time knew that this was not the way to argue. And it's Descartes arguing this way and failing to make it work that gives us the progress of saying, well, you know, kind of that's a blind alley. Rationalism is a blind alley. It's really not where we should be going for philosophy. So, is there a possibility that there was a lack of. Um Academia? Oh no, there, there was a lot of this. academia back then. But academia was what we might call corrupt. Look up scholasticism. And that's what Descartes was fighting against. Uh, the universities were dominated by people who wanted to make Aristotle a precursor of the Bible. They wanted to, they, there were the certain people who were famous for being wise, and they wanted to make them all right and all agree with each other. And so a lot of people wasted a lot of effort in, in coming up with ways to interpret everybody so that they all appeared to agree. And it was all nonsense. Most scholastic philosophers were just rubbish. Uh, we'll talk about one who wasn't, a, a good one, William of Ockham. Um, when we talk about uh, Locke, but most uh, scholastic philosophers were complete rubbish, and Descartes really, really rejected them. Um, so there wasn't a lack of academia, but there was a lack of good academia. And again, René Descartes is one of the people we have to thank for universities not being chock full of idiots. Uh, universities, well, you know, you have the law school and stuff like that. People learn law and stuff like that. But philosophy before Descartes in, in the university was just rubbish. Uh, and Descartes is, Descartes is actually responsible for the main impetus for starting the process of the gradual transformation of society, of, of Western society, from superstition to, um, to the use of reason, which is called modernism. And Descartes was, uh, was one of the main movers of, of modernism, which is the thing that gave us the, the parts of the modern world that we like, like spaceships and public health and, and computers. And, um, mm -hmm. and finally, gay marriage. And um, you know, social progress, divorce is no longer illegal, and all that kind of stuff. And that all really stems from Descartes and, and people who follow Descartes and thought, ooh, Instead of just blindly lashing out at everybody and doing what we're told without thinking, let's think about what we're doing and, and you know do what, what works out to be the best logically. So Ducard again didn't invent that, but he really promoted it. And that's what, what happened because of the big caught on. Alright, so here's a famous Cartesian argument that I think is wrong, but I think is really, really interesting, and demonstrates how philosophy was done before Locke, before the empiricists. It's called the concept 
of perfection. Right. Now, Descartes knows that his mind exists, or he, as he put it, said, I know that I exist. How do I exist? What is my existence? Well, my existence is, is at this point in time, is explained in terms of thought. I am thoughts. I am ideas. Right? He does not think of himself as a physical body. He does not think of his mind as a product of his brain. In Descartes' time, the idea that the brain made the mind was a very radical idea, and I don't know if there were anyone at that time, how many people at that time connected the brain and the mind. Um, you know this thing, I love you with all my heart? People tended to associate thinking and feeling with this, this central organ here at the heart, and not, not with this. This was a, right. it, was, it was considered a literal statement. Uh, to say you, you wanted something with all your heart, right? Because there's a heart in there doing the wanting. So, right. I exist as a mind. This mind contains concepts or ideas. Mind contains concepts or ideas. One such concept is So far, so good. Right? I think we could all say that our minds exist, because if they didn't, we wouldn't be thinking. You wouldn't be thinking. Uh, and that your minds have ideas, have concepts in them. If they didn't have concepts, you couldn't think about them. And um, I think it's a good bet to think that everyone in here knows the concept of perfection. That is, you've heard the word perfect. Ooh, that's perfect. Uh, well, you know, it's a good day, but it wasn't perfect. Right? We, we know this, we know what perfect means, and we know what the contrast case is, something with a, with a defect. Oh, talking of defect. Oh, no, I've got one. I've got a good one. Generally, my coffee marks uh, acquire chips and things as they, as they go through life. This is a, this is a pretty good one. All right. Now, so, and we have that concept of perfection in us, right? This concept of perfection that you have in your mind, it's either from experience, It's from experience, it's either from experience, which means from seeing things that are perfect. And someone says, look, look at that, that's perfect. If you look at it and say, oh yes, yes it is. All right, that's what perfect means. Or innate. So again, we have this thing, this kind of argument. This thing is either this or this. Well, we eliminate this, so it's this. Makes sense. The slave boy argument, we did that. Uh, the wax argument, we did that. Right. Has it worked yet? No, no, no. But maybe it'll work this time. So it's either from experience or innate. Right, now I'm going to do a sub argument. I'm going to go like ABC. Okay. Do 
we ever actually experience anything that's perfect? No. No, we don't. We know that. Look, see this? The rim of the cup looks like a perfect circle. But if you get close with a good lens, you'll see imperfections. If you look at a metal surface, it might seem perfectly smooth to you. But you get closer, and sometimes you can get closer and you see um, scratches of the naked eye. This looks pretty smooth to me, but actually, actually if I look at the reflections of lights, I can see them like wiggle, so I know it's not perfectly smooth. Um, or you can get a microscope. I once saw an electron micrograph of a, um, of, a, of a chunk of what appeared to be perfectly smooth a metal. Uh, no, or it might have been salt or something. And then you look at the micrograph and there's all these cracks and chasms and layers and broken off things. Uh, it, it didn't look perfect at all close up. So there's nothing in the world that's perfect. Which means that nothing that we ever experience is perfect. Well, we have no experience of perfection, so the concept of perfection is innate. So that's a typical Cartesian Platonic argument. We have no experience of perfection. We have the idea of perfection. Uh, can't have come from experience, so it must be made. By an I just mean not from experience. somehow created this idea or from outside. Um, and okay, so it's either from me or from outside. Descartes says, there's another sub-argument. I'm not perfect. And his reason for saying he's not perfect is because I doubt. It strikes me as really weird, but really, really indicative of Descartes' preferences and cultural biases. If I had no doubts, I would be perfect. That strikes me as bizarre. I, I think so, a human being who has no doubts about anything is, is either a, is, is, is psychotic. I, I, like, psychotic. Or, or at least deeply, deeply, deeply stupid. I have met people who are absolutely certain of their ideas and um, they were always wrong. and usually annoying. So Descartes says, I'm not perfect because I, I, I have doubts. So, so it's not from him, it's from outside. Um, it must have come from a perfect thing. It must have come from the perfect thing, which means that a perfect thing exists.
perfect thing exists. Now, what, did, what does Descartes think is the only possible perfect thing? God. God, yeah. All right, so, God, omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, exists. Now, Descartes hasn't proven the existence of any old God. He has proven the existence of a perfect God. A God that is, can do anything, is perfectly powerful, perfectly wise, or perfectly knowing, knows everything, and only benevolent. It is, is absolutely nice. <coughs> and this is, this is Descartes' con concept of a perfect thing. So, God exists. And you see why I think this is a brilliant argument? Or is it, you know, a brilliantly weird argument? Because he starts with a concept existing in his mind, and from that, believes that he proves the existence of God. And so he's got two existences here, himself and God. The rest of us, the material world, He's not certain of that. Now remember this is also based on the um, concept of certainty. Right? He thinks that each one of these follows from the ones before. Right? My mind contains the concept of perfection. It's either from an experience of innate, I rule out experience, so it's innate. And he thinks that that's certain, because these are the only two possibilities. And he's ruled out experience absolutely. He thinks. So the concept of perfection is innate. It's either from me, I either make it myself, or it's made outside me and put in me. Right. Well, it can't be from me because I'm not perfect. A perfect thing cannot make an idea a concept of perfect. An imperfect thing cannot make a concept of perfection. Descartes thinks. So it must have come from a perfect thing, that perfect thing is um, exists and is, it is omnipotent, omniscient, and, other. and this actually, you know, if you think about a perfect thing, right, what would be the most perfect being, the most perfect existence possible, it actually si sounds at least halfway reasonable to me that if we were to conceive of a perfect being, it would be an intelligent being that knows everything and can do anything that's logically possible for it to do, that, uh, and it's is nice, because an imperfect thing, you know, meanness is an imperfection, right? Being, a, I, I certainly think so. Um, I'm going to say halfway reasonable, because there's a lot of cultural baggage that's loaded into this conception of perfection. All right, so I'm going to stop here for a bit, and um, ask to criticize this part of the argument. Um, what, what's the weakness here? And one of the things in philosophy is you can look, you know, you, can, you may notice this, you can look at an argument and know that it's bad and just not be able to put your finger on what's bad about it. Okay. Now, He thinks that the evil genius can't touch this because this is all logical deductions, right? Now, uh, I think that the weakness of the argument is here, where it says we have no experience of perfection, so the concept of concept of perfection is innate. That's my idea of the weakness. This is why I think what I think is wrong with the argument. Now, I'm going to say A is true, but A does not imply 5. Right. 
Because, and here's the, I'm going to put it here in red. We don't have to experience actual perfection to get the concept. We don't have to experience actual perfection to get the concept. I can think of at least two ways that I could communicate the idea of perfection to you by showing you things that were not perfect and talking about them. First, I show you my coffee cup and I say this is what a perfect circle looks like. And I don't bring it under a microscope. I don't hand you a, micro, a magnifying glass and say, here, look at the, look at the rim, look at, look at this. I don't hand you a, a calipers and, and have you go around it to see. I just say, look, here's a perfect circle. This is what a perfect circle looks like. At this distance, it looks like a perfect circle. Or I take, now that we've got good engineering, which Descartes really didn't have in his day, they didn't, they, they didn't have the equipment to make well, actually, a lathe, a lathe. A lathe will make a perfect circle. If you lathe something and then cut it, you can make a perfect circle. But it had very few perfect circles. Now, the, the ring around the, the muzzle on my uh, camera, um, you see lots of things that, that, as far as you can tell, are perfect circles. And remember, experience, sensory experience, is not you contacting directly a physical object. It's you getting sensory information about this object. Right? Do you understand the difference there? You don't, you're not touching this. You're not up inside it. It's not inside your brain. What's happening is light is coming off various sources in this room and it is bouncing off and uh, bouncing off it in such a way that it, a picture forms on your retina. That's what's happening. So it's your sensory experience of that. Oh man, there are some pictures on the web. I just realized this. I could have used this in the reading. Um, you ever seen this? I think it looks, if I, can, if I can do it. Oh, I can't do it. All right. It's, um, I can't, even, I can't manage it. But there's this um, thing where you have like, it looks like a triangle made of pieces of wood, but the way they're nailed together is like they're sort of twisting around. You see, optical illusion. Like, uh, uh, yeah, it's like that. diagram right you look up this end it's three prongs you look down here it's a it's a it's a u band right and it's messing with your head right mm -hmm. now there's one the way you have the so it looks like a triangle but they can't all be joined up that way it looks like they're twisted well there's a fella who made a big long sculpture and it's like spread out like this it's like a hundred yards long but if you stand just in the right place, it makes that optical illusion um, picture come out right. I used to know a lot of these, and I can't, I can't find them anymore. Um, so, right? So, our minds can take things that are actually not perfect, but they look perfect to us. Oh, let the uh, right. Uh, You 
know the thing where you, I, that's not, it's not working the way I draw it, but you know, there's the lines coming in, and then there's two lines across, and the two parallel, the two lines that are actually parallel look bent because of the lines behind them. So you look at optical illusions, what we see is often different from what's there. And so it's very easy for us to look and it, you know, look at that and say, hey, as far as I can tell, this is perfect. This looks perfect. And you can say to you, I can say to you, well, imagine that it doesn't, those flaws that we see under a microscope aren't there. Right? You look at a flawed part, well, imagine it's like a smooth <coughs> part. Right? So you can imagine, uh, we can imagine things that are perfect. So five is not true. We have no, well, actually A is not true. We have experiences of perfection. They're false, they're illusions, but they're still our experiences. We have experiences of things that look perfect to us, and that's enough to give us the concept. So we can get the, we can get the concept from outside, so Descartes is wrong. That, it's, that it has to be an 8. I'll put that down here. We can get the concept from experience. So it isn't proved to be oh, right. you know, squeeze this in B in eight. It's not proved to be an eight. Descartes' argument fails. He does not prove what he intended, what he tried to prove. He does not prove what he thinks he proves. So he has not proved that God exists. But I'm going to act like he did and give his argument for the external world. One thing that's, that's uh, characteristic of uh, rationalism is very long arguments to pay no attention to evidence, or little or no attention to evidence. They start, might start with a little bit of evidence at the beginning, or they might start entirely from concepts. And they also make a lot of, ins uh, uh, they also make a lot of assumptions that turn out to be weak. Um, but again, they were start, they, this is, um, Nobody knew any better at the time, and because they did this is why we know better now. So, oops. Descartes' argument for the external world. And this is, this is going to strike you as weird because usually arguments that concern God and the external world usually go the other way. Usually people say, look, here's the world, we're touching it, we're kicking it around, we're, we're jumping around in it, bits of it are falling on us, we have to, you know, um, you, know, you have to watch out, part of the external world will come up and eat you or, or something like that. We, we sort of said, this is our starting point, we're experiencing this. Descartes, rationalist philosopher, said, look, that's all sensory information, uh, could be right, could be wrong, you can't be certain of anything. I'm going to start with a position of certainty. Um, and his first premise, one that I don't believe is, is supported, is that it is certain that God exists. That in Descartes that's based on the concept of perfection argument, but you know if there was another argument that 
proved God's existence with certainty, you could, you could use that. We're just going to take that as his premise. It is certain that God exists. Um, God is certainly... Right, oh. God is perfect. From... From the concept. Descartes' concept of God is that God is per a perfect being, the only possible perfect being. If it wasn't perfect, he wouldn't be God. Could not be, could not be God. So, one just follows from two. It's just part of the saying, God exists, is saying a perfect being exists. So, God is the name for this perfect being. But we're going to use God's perfection. No perfect being is a deceiver. No perfect being is a deceiver. Well, think about this. Suppose you have an acquaintance who regularly fools you about stuff. Would you consider that person perfect? Someone who you know, you, you're asking for information, and they give you wrong information, you rely on that information, and you get into trouble. I had a student go to the wrong room for, counsel, for tutoring without making an appointment, and the, the student relied on my information, and therefore came to school, um, on our way to work, I went to a lot of trouble to get tutoring, and the tutor wasn't there because I'd given her the wrong information. So I'm not perfect. Why did I give the wrong information? Well, actually, I was given wrong information by my uh, division office. They didn't tell me that appointments were necessary. They didn't even give the tutor's phone number, and they told me the wrong room. So they're not perfect either. So let's say someone gives you wrong, wrong information. Have you ever had that? If someone gives you wrong information, you rely on it, and you get into trouble. And, well, say someone gives you wrong information, and you rely on it, and you get into trouble, and then you come back from six weeks in the desert or, or some horrible <laughs> thing, or you were in a, had to be in a mental hospital for, for two weeks, or you were in jail while they sorted it all out. And you get out of jail, and you're, you, you get home, and you're hanging around with people, and you say, and you say this guy, he lied to me. And then another one, of you, another one of your acquaintances goes, yeah, I know. Yeah, I knew when he told you that, that he was lying. Would the second person who allowed a deception be perfect? No. All right. So beings who deceive and beings who allow deception are not perfect. God neither deceives nor allows it. It meaning deception here, so I can finish up the line. God neither, neither deceives nor allows deception. Well, if God does not allow deception, is the evil genius demon deceiver going to exist? Or, or operate at least? Mm -hmm. Right. So... So, God, being perfectly powerful, precludes, I mean, God rules out, the existence of God rules out the existence of the demon deceiver. Alright, so we're not being 
systematically deceived. Now, does that mean we can rely on our senses? Because there's nobody who has this magic power to fool us. Well, no, because first, uh, you know, our senses are still not absolutely reliable. Remember that the evil genius is not a real possibility in terms of, oh, this thing could be out here. It's more of a metaphor for the fact that we can be fooled at any time. Right. And right, when we thought about this before, that was seen to be an, an unsolvable quandary. Any sensory information could turn out to be bad. But now we have God. At this point of the argument, we have God. God exists. God is perfect. God is omnibenevolent and omnipotent and omniscient. So, God precludes the demon deceiver. Now, suppose it's the case that we could never have certain knowledge. Would God, would that be nice for us? And would a benevolent, just deity um, allow that to happen? Remember, if we could never have certain knowledge, you know, we could never justly execute anyone. We could never fight a just war. We could, we could never, you know, do violence to people um, because we'd always be uncertain about whether it's really justified. Descartes, Descartes believes, right, oops, seven, 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 in order to have knowledge, we must be able to be certain about some things. Remember that Descartes conflates knowledge with certainty. Descartes thinks that if it ain't certain, it ain't knowledge. If it ain't certain, it ain't knowledge. So, in order to have knowledge, we must be able to be certain about things. How could we live if we haven't not, didn't have knowledge? We could not live, we could not live well, we could not be happy without knowledge. could not live well, we could not live in good circumstances if we don't have knowledge, according to Descartes. In order to have knowledge, we must be able to be certain about some things. God would not leave us so. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. A God, God would not leave the human race in such a terrible state. God wouldn't do that to us. God would not leave us so. Um, God would not let us languish um, in such a terrible state. So from this, uh,
sense, certainty is possible in sensory knowledge. Right? Because God does not allow deception, God does not allow us to languish in ignorance, God allows us to know stuff, and because knowledge, for Descartes, requires certainty, God allows us to be certain in terms of sensory knowledge. Because most of what we know comes from sensory knowledge. Right? The existence of Africa, Madagascar, uh, Bahama, the Bahamas, Tierra del Fuego, all the places on the earth, the moon, um, the, the proper way to do agriculture, how wheat grows, how to take care of horses and cows and so on. These all depend on knowledge. So we must be able to certainty as possible and certain sensory knowledge. And notice how knowledge and certainty are linked for Descartes as they are not linked for other thinkers. Not everybody thinks the way Descartes does. I certainly don't. I don't think knowledge and certainty really go together. I think knowledge, you have very high probability, but you never have certainty. For Descartes, if it's knowledge, it's certain, and it's possible. <clears throat> so certainty is possible in sensory knowledge. Well, if certainty is possible in sensory knowledge, what are we certain about? classes before and nobody gets it and I have to fill it in so this sort of like what are we most what, uh, what are we most certain about and the reason most people don't get this uh, example is that they take that thing that, that we're most certain about so much for granted that they don't even think that it's possible to doubt it that we, we would have a belief about it because it's so firmly believed in, we don't know we believe in it. So, what is the one thing that we have the most certainty about? Um, and I'll give you an example about being most certain. Um, which am I more certain of? That I have five fingers or that I have fingers at all? Five fingers. That I'm most certain that it's five. But how could it be five if I don't have fingers? True. Right? So I'm most certain that I have fingers. Um, so um, which am I more certain about? That the air contains oxygen or that it contains 21% oxygen? It could contain oxygen without it being 21%. But it can't be 21% oxygen without it containing oxygen. Um, let's see. I'm trying to come up with, a, with a, a, another thing. Um, given that California is in the, United, in the United States, which am I more certain of? That um, Cyprus is in the United States or it's in that part of the United States that's called California? It's in the US. The most general thing is the thing that we're most certain about because if it's not true, the specific thing is false. And the specific thing can be false. Because what if California was in Colombia? I have no idea whether that worked or not. I'm just going to skip over. All right. So. I'm more certain that I have a body than I am of the shape of the body. We're more certain that land exists about, than about the shape of it. And see how it gets more general. What is the most general statement of existence that I can make, right? I can say uh, the solar system exists, right? Or I can say things exist in space, stars exist. Like that. What is the absolute most certain thing I have. Of all the pieces of knowledge that I have, all the, all the beliefs I have, 
which is the one that if it was not true would blow away everything else? Me as the mind. No, because uh, the, the world can exist without me having a mind. Things can exist without me having a mind. That you exist yourself. No, that's, you're going back to a different argument. You're trying, remember, I'm not going back to what we said before. This is a new <coughs> subject. Well, the thing that we can most, and you're going to kick yourselves, the thing we're most certain of is that the universe exists at all. Right? If the universe doesn't exist, there's no California, there's no United States, there's no, right? Think of anything. If this didn't exist, the universe wouldn't exist. There isn't anything. The most thing we are most certain about in terms of things we know through the senses, right? Sense based beliefs are mostly about, or most about, I'll call that most about, the external physical world. So, well, we are certain, because it's not knowledge if it's not certain for Descartes, about the existence Notice that I, I fudged this letter because I couldn't remember how to spell existence. Of the physical world. We are most certain about the existence of the physical world. That's Descartes' argument for the reliability of the senses. The senses are reliable. If we use them right, the senses are reliable. We can find certain information from the senses. And from this, the physical world has to exist. Because if the physical world did not exist, if the physical world did not exist, certainty would not be possible in sensory knowledge. And if certainty, if certainty was not possible in sensory knowledge, God would not be perfect. God would be either incapable of making certainty possible, um, or, or, or he didn't know about uh, our problem with cert needing certainty, or he wouldn't care about it. He'd be like, yeah, I know, you, you, you guys are messing yourselves up. I don't care. I'm going to let leave you. Right? But he's omnibenevolent. So if he's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent, he will know about the problem, want to fix the problem, and be able to fix the problem. So the problem will be fixed with absolute certainty. Right. Now, where's the weakness in this argument from my perspective? Well, what, I, what am I going to say is the weakness in the argument? Really, and this is why, why I think it's a brilliant argument, really, the only weakness I see in this argument is the first premise. Descartes says God exists, and his argument for God's existence falls down because we can get the, we can get concepts from experience. But that's it. Otherwise, I, I think this, this this seems to work. Okay. Um, any questions? My notes are on my computer, and my computer is apparently. No, oh, there you go. Come on. Apparently not going to react. Alright. So, ah, here we go. about this? Any questions about any of the topics we've covered today? The rationalism of uh, ready to come. One question. Yes. Number eight, he says we can't be happy without knowledge. Well, we can't. Why wouldn't he say something else other than happy? Oh, he, he probably did say something else. I said happy. Oh. So, um, what he said was probably better. 
But the thing is, we can't get along in our lives without knowledge. Can we get along without knowing stuff? Where he goes wrong, the other place he goes wrong is um, Actually, number seven is actually weak, too. Right. In order for not, we, us to have knowledge, we have to be certain about things. In, your, in, 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 in what you know about science, is science ever absolutely certain about anything? No. Science is theory-based. Now, the paradox here is people use that to denigrate science. They say, oh, science is just theories and it's uncertain. Well, yeah, it is just theories and it is uncertain, but it's a damn sight more reliable than the way you do business. The people who knock science believe things with emotional certainty, which they don't have logically. They don't have logical certainty. They have things that they passionately want to be true. And they look at science and say, well, science is admits this is just a theory. It could be false. It's an idea. It's a, okay, there are theories in science that are supported by so much evidence that it's just insane to doubt them. It, it's ludicrous. If you understand the theory and the evidence behind it, it, it's almost like it has to be true. There's a theoretical, logical possibility that it's false. It could be that the way life works is uh, or the universe works is just an amazing series of, of random coincidences that just happen to fall into a pattern such that every time we look carefully we find the same results. That's possible, logically. So there's a logic it's logically possible that science is wrong about evolution through natural selection. It's logically possible that science is wrong about quantum mechanics. It's logically possible Actually, science is wrong about quantum mechanics. They just have about string theory or uh, um, M theory. What's the? Did anyone know the new theory? Damn, I, know. I think it's M theory. Um, so it's logic. About, well, we know M theory is, is is not quite right. We just don't have anything better yet. Uh, but um, evolution through natural selection. I, I just find it mind-boggling to think of anyone who wouldn't accept it for re reasons other than religion. Um, there's others. Oh, global, uh, anthropogenic global warming. Massive amounts of evidence in favor. No serious criticism from the climate science community. Um, right. Business week, yeah, but not this climate science community. Um, so, we have knowledge enough to do stuff, we have the kind of knowledge net, we have enough knowledge that we can make computers and, you know, you know, I have like four different modes of communication possible through the, this thing. I don't know what this thing is capable of, really, I have no idea of the limits of its capability, just that, you know, someone says, can you do this, and I don't know, maybe there's an app for that, and I'll look it up, yeah, there's an app for that, you know. Right. I know it can't shoot 22 caliber rounds because I've tried. But it makes a, I found out the other day it makes a flashlight. I thought, oh, I never thought of that, but yeah, right, of course. So that's all possible, and with, from science, from not being said. Okay. So um, all right, I'm going to turn my thing off, and I'm going to look at my notes.